Welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. And I have to admit to you guys out there, and girls too, that I was pretty excited to come to the uh, radio microphones today. I've been looking forward to recording this show all week long. We've got a lot of material. People across the United States have been losing their minds. And the anti-gun bullies are just absolutely freaking out in America right now. And we're going to take some time to discuss that here in a little bit. But before we do, we want to make sure that we recognize our good buddy over there across the table from me, Jared. Jared, how are we doing today? I'm doing fantastic today. It's kind of gloomy outside, but I'm in here talking to you guys, so it's all good. Yes, for the rest of you out there in the United States who are uh, desirous of rain, uh, if you'd like some rain, please come down to South Mississippi because, no kidding, it has rained every single day for, what, the last 45 days, 46 days, something like that? Yeah, every single day. And, and that whole time that he was just talking, the sun came out and then went back behind the clouds twice. <laughs> well, we are uh, we are still, even though it's not uh, the sunny Gulf Coast today, uh, and oh, we're excited. We're excited. Uh, what do we got going tonight, Jared? Tell them where we are going, who we're going to see tonight. Holy cow, I just got excited because I forgot. Is that bad? Am I a bad person? No, you're not a bad person. You're just a busy person. Yeah, busy. We'll go with that. Uh, we're going to see Uncle Ted tonight at the Hard Rock. That's right, Uncle Ted Nugent. We're uh, we've got uh, tickets to go see Uncle Ted at the Hard Rock tonight. Uh, if you're uh, if you are a long time, and I'm talking if you're a long time fan, not of Student of the Gun, but of Paul Markle and my writing, uh, you guys who may have been with us for the last ten, twelve, fifteen years know that uh, I actually write like a week after nine eleven interviewed Ted uh, for a magazine article in SWAT magazine, going all the way back to two thousand and one. And uh, Jared and I, when Jared was just a wee little one, he was, you weren't even quite 10 years old yet, were you? Yeah, I wasn't even old enough to realize how awesome what was happening yeah, was. Yeah, Jared and, uh, Jared and I went up and uh, we hunted on Ted's property up in Michigan. You, you guys who are Ted Nugent fans know that he was born in Michigan. Uh, I was born in Detroit, Michigan, and I grew up listening to Ted on the radio, uh, listening to his radio interviews and reading about him and so forth. And he is a, a Michigan guy. He was born and raised up there. And he's got property in Michigan, as well as, of course, a lot of you Ted Nugent fans know that he has a big ranch in Texas. But, yeah, when Jared was just a little one, he was not quite 10 years old yet, uh, we went up and hunted on his Sunrise Acres Ranch up there in Texas and had ourselves a good time. And let me tell you what, he was uh, – I'm, I don't claim to be a good buddy of Ted Nugent. We've met, we've talked, uh, you know, we've we've shared pleasantries and so forth. But uh, for those of you who never met Ted Nugent, he was a very, very down to earth person. He took the time, and as you can imagine, he's a busy guy. And the weekend that we were up there, there was a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Ted Nugent has a organization called the United Sportsmen of America, Ted Nugent's USA. And they had a big United Sportsmen of America gathering that weekend up there in Michigan. But Ted took the time out of his really busy schedule to take us around his ranch. He let us, you know, he loaded us up in one of his big four by four, uh, you know, Suburbans or what have you, and drove us around the ranch, took some time to talk with Jared, you know, signed autographs and took pictures and what have you. Very, very cordial gentleman, very down to earth guy. And uh, for those of you who like, I mean, obviously, Ted is the, he is the Motor City madman. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and uh, he gets a little exercised. You, those of you who think Paul Markle uh, is a little exercised or can can uh, get a little political at times. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> but uh, just a quick insight about that. And we're you know, once we're uh, done recording today, actually, we have to go over there. Uh, and uh, and get our and get our seats and and what have you. So let's let's get right into it. Now, getting right into it, of course, I'm sitting here in the glorious Student of the Gun Radio Studios, uh, which also uh, alternate as the TV studio. But uh, I've got my crossbreed holster on, and in my crossbreed holster, I have a car P45. Uh, the car P45 is my summertime shorts and a t-shirt gun. It's so thin and it carries so well that I can literally, no kidding walk around in shorts with just a loose t-shirt draped over it and nobody is ever any of the wiser except for you guys because you're listening to me and now you know uh so we've got i've got my car p45 and my crossbreed holster and uh we uh we want to acknowledge our buddies at keltec down there in Cocoa, florida 
If you watch the show online this week, if you go to studentofthegun.com, and all of you should know by now, just all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, and there will be a high-definition television episode right there on the main page that you can watch. And the cool thing about that, and we talked about this a little bit last week, but we want to make sure that everybody out there within the sound of my voice is aware of it. If you have... You know, Xbox Live or what's that thing, with that funky thing where you wave your arms around, Jared? The Kinect? The, or the, uh, no, the other one, the Nintendo. Oh, the Wii. The Wii, yeah. Well, anyway, if you have any of these, uh, if, or if you're 16 or 17-year-old or 14-year-old, whatever, your kids have got uh, these online packages. Most of them have the new YouTube app. Uh, the new YouTube application, you can go on to your big screen, you know, 37, 42, 59, 78-inch TV, whatever you got there in your den, and you go to the, the YouTube application, you type in Student of the Gun TV, it pulls up our videos, and you can watch the latest HD video directly through YouTube without paying a dime or a nickel to your cable company or DirecTV or Dish or anybody. Now, I don't want to undercut our guys at Dish, but if all you have is, you know, you watch your TV, a lot of people have said to us, I don't have anything other than, you know, cable or not cable, uh, internet. And we watch our TV through Netflix or through Xbox Live or whatever. That's cool. Because you know, what we've done for you guys and what Jared has done is he's put the, he's putting the shows up each week. A new episode goes up in high definition. So even if you have, a, you know, you guys know if you have a big screen TV and you watch something in, in, in uh, low definition or standard def, and then you watch a high definition show, you're like, wow, check that out. Well, you can do that. You can watch the show through your, you know, Xbox Live with a YouTube app. Now, yes, we're also on TV. We posted that last week, and someone's like, whoa, does that mean you're not on TV anymore? No, dudes, we're not shrinking. We're expanding. It's lit We're literally trying to – Jared, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make it so they have no excuse, right? Yeah, no excuses. Yeah, we're trying to make it so that you have absolutely no reason not to watch Student of the Gun, to listen to the Student of the Gun, and so forth. So uh, the reason I brought that up is because uh, our good buddies, Keltec, uh, we they're featured uh, during the show. During the show, you can see the uh, the segment that we did on the PMR-30. That's on the show that's online right now. So if you go to studentofthegun.com, you click on the latest episode, you can see our review of the PMR-30 pistol. Now, don't forget, for everything Student of the Gun, Jared's been working real hard on the uh, the Student of the Gun gear store, making sure that it's updated. We've got the stickers, the new stickers there. we got camouflage ones, black and white ones. We have T-shirts in stock, DVDs in stock, all of that good stuff, so check it out. And, Jared, tell tell the audience how proud you are of them this week, my social media manager. I am very proud of all of you guys for working so hard and keeping up with all of our social media. We've got quite a bit of them. We're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. We've got two YouTube channels, Student of the Gun TV and SOTG Homeroom. And we're on Google+, Pinterest, Instagram, and Vimeo. And that was a mouthful. So, um, And as you guys know, we've got seven days until this big Caltech KSG giveaway. And we've, we're throwing in some frog lube for you guys to keep that the KSG maintenance. And what else are we giving away? Oh, the five flashlights. Five flashlights. We've got five flashlights for the runner-ups. So you've got the five flashlights, the frog tube from Frog Lube, and the KSG. And if one entry isn't enough for you guys, for each of the social media sites that you follow, like, or subscribe to, you earn an extra entry for a grand total of 10 entries. And uh, the I gave you a list of all the stuff that you can follow. So go like us, subscribe to us, follow us on there, and you can earn up to 10 entries just by doing that. And as an added bonus, any product that you purchase from the Student of the Gun Gear store at studentofthegungear.com, you get one extra entry. So you could earn virtually an unlimited amount of entries to that giveaway. Yeah, that's coming up really soon, and uh, we've got had a lot of excitement. A lot of you folks out there are just kind of chomping at the bit, and uh, we, we've got it. We've got, like I said, the shotgun, the flashlights, the frog, uh, the frog tube, uh, weapons, weapons maintenance kit, and just uh, in in our pockets, we have a couple of more. We're working with uh, two of our other sponsors right now, and we don't want to water down the Caltech giveaway by by putting the other stuff out. But keep in mind. 
We do this all year long. This isn't just a one-time deal. And uh, so as long as you are an active subscriber to Student of the Gun, as long as you're an active subscriber, and we know you tricky guys out there. We know the guys that go and subscribe and then the next morning go and unsubscribe. Hey, you can do that all day long, every single day. This is America. But only our active subscribers are eligible for our contest because, look, that's only fair, right? Well, let's get into it. Jared, you know, we said we had a lot of stuff to talk about this week. And uh, we do. We're going to go ahead and kick it off like we normally do with our student of the week contest. Again, you guys have been fantastic. You're you're hitting us up with a lot of student of the week questions. And if we don't pick your question, don't feel bad. Uh, quite frankly, a lot of the questions that we do get, uh, we use those as the impetus for educational segments, for some of the articles that we put up weekly. So even though we didn't mention it on the radio, we might have addressed it uh, in this week's article or last week's. We might hit it up in the uh, Student of the Gun homeroom videos. So you got to make sure that you're paying attention to all that stuff. Jared, go ahead and tell us who the student of the week is and what their question is. Before I get into that, I want to apologize. Um, I, when I put the sticker up on the store, I forgot to take the shipping off of it. And who wants to pay shipping for a sticker? So I'm going to take that off, and it'll just be the sticker price with free shipping. So check that out at studentofthegungear.com. And our student of the week is Lauren Wines, and he wants to know, if you have to draw your weapon, how do you not get shot when the good guys arrive? All right, excellent question. A lot of you concealed carry folks out there, you're probably thinking that. You're like, well, and, and you've been in, you know where you've been. You've been in the gun shop. You've been on the public range. You've been at gun shows or whatever, where people, where your street corner experts like to give you advice and say, oh, well, you know, this or that or the other. And and here's the real deal. The real deal is the world is an uncertain place and there are no guarantees. Sorry, I hate to break your bubble there, but there are no guarantees in life. You can literally do everything right and still end up losing or still end up shot. That's just the way the world is. Uh, and you can do things wrong and just have luck with you. But the best way to keep luck with you is through training and education. And if you have to use a firearm to defend your own life, you, you you used it for whatever reason. You either, and this this goes as well with not just shooting somebody. Let's say, you know quite often, you know if you look at statistics, uh, firearms are used in self defense without firing a shot all the time. Uh, there's there's more firearms that are used as defensive tools. The bad guy sees that you have a gun, you tell him stop, and he decides, oop, I don't want to mess with this guy. I picked the wrong victim. I'm out of here. So they leave or surrender or whatever. Most they're not going to lay on the ground and let you arrest them. That that doesn't happen in the real world. What happens in the real world generally is if you're in public and someone confronts you with deadly force and you respond in kind, uh, if they're not in the process of doing it already, they see that you have a gun or acknowledge that fact, they will run away. They're not just going to kneel down in the parking lot outside of Walmart with their hands over their heads and surrender to you. That just that doesn't work. Uh, now, they may, might do that in your home, but that's a different story. How do you keep the cops from shooting you when you have to use your gun lawfully? Well, A, number one, understand that they're probably on the way. Uh, that even if you didn't call them, someone else probably did. The The bystander or the witness that you have no idea is there probably called them and they are probably on the way. You're going to be excited. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about the excited delirium, uh, the time-space distortion, the, you know, the effects of adrenaline and so forth. Your priority is to keep yourself and the people that you love alive, correct? That's the whole point. Do what you need to do. Ensure that you are safe. Ensure that your family and friends, whoever happens to be close with you there, ensure that they are all safe, that they are unharmed. If they need medical attention, get it for them. Once you are assured that the threat is no longer valid, put the gun away. And if it was, if it came out of a holster on your body, put it back into that holster. A lot of guys will say, throw your gun down. Um, I'm not a big, I'm not a big proponent of throw your gun down because if you throw your gun down, then what do you have? Now you have a loose firearm out there that you don't have control over. And, you know, I, I was actually 
privy to a conversation where someone said, yeah, you just need to throw it down. And that way they'll see that you threw it down and know that you're a good guy. No, because it's the exact opposite. That's what bad people do when confronted with cops because they know, oh, if I have this gun in my hand, that cop going to shoot me. So they'll throw it down. Uh, I, I don't recommend the leaving a firearm loose laying around on the ground. And people say, well, what about the bad guy? What if he had a gun or a knife? And stay away from the bad guy. Stay away from the bad guy. Uh, don't You don't need to arrest them. It is not you, your main purpose there is to keep yourself and your family members alive and safe. That is your priority. That's the priority, priority number one. People get all bunged up and they start thinking that they're going to do this and that and all the other things. No, stop yourself. Your, pri- your priority, the only thing you owe anyone is to keep yourself and your family alive. So put when you no longer need the gun and you're assured of that, you feel confident of that, put it away. Put it away. And when the police arrive, put your hands over your, and if you're able to, uh, put your hands over your head, point, and say, that guy over there tried to kill me. I had to shoot him. And if they come up, say, you know, where's, you know, do you have any guns? I would say, I have a concealed carry permit. I wouldn't yell out, I have a gun, because all they're going to hear is gun. Uh, I, I wouldn't start out the conversation with the word gun in it. I would say something like, I am the victim. He attacked me. I have a concealed carry permit and go from there. But the, uh, the main thing is, is you don't want to be walking around with a gun in your hand when the police show up. Cause all, remember we talked about this before they're all they're doing is they're responding to shots fired in wherever, you know, the, the freaking parking lot of the, the, apartment complex or, you know, inside the freaking Waffle House or whatever. That's what they're responding to. They're not responding to Joe Citizen just used a firearm to defend his life against some scumbags. That's not their men- their mindset or their mentality. All they know is there are people with guns that are shooting each other and they need to get there and stop them. So uh, put if you don't need it anymore, if your family is safe, put it away. And if people say, well, what if I'm right in the process of doing it and there's a police officer there? Dude, I don't know what to tell you. I I mean, yeah, bad things do happen to, you know, if he's already there and the bad guy starts shooting or attacking you, uh, I don't know how that happened. But the, the answer to that question is, is when you no longer need the gun, secure it and put it away. Don't start the conversation out with I have a gun or the word gun. Start it out some other way. Uh, and just make sure that you and your family members are safe. That is your number one priority. Your number one priority is not arresting people. It's not, you know, going over to check the bad guy or to secure them or anything. No, just let them lay where they lay, uh, you know, and go from there. This is a good time to, um, tell the audience your new quote that you came up with. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we were, uh, I was just thinking about this and I decided, well, I'm going to make it public and people, you know, you run into the, well, why do you carry a gun? Are you looking for a fight? You get the, the ninnies, you know, the, the, uh, the people that have had, uh, experimental surgery to have their testicles removed. They'll ask you things like, well, why do you think you need to carry a gun? Are you looking for a fight? And the answer to that is no, we don't carry guns because we're looking for a fight. We carry guns because somewhere out there, there is a fight that is looking for us or looking for you. TM, TM not to be used without express permission, student of the gun, Inc. But uh, that that is why, because somewhere out there, there's a fight and it's looking for you. Is it going to find you today? I don't know. Do you know that? If I could answer that question, I wouldn't go there. But I can't answer that question. So we don't carry guns because we're looking for a fight. We carry guns because somewhere out there there's a fight and it's looking for you. Now let's talk about uh, you are, if you're listening to the sound of my voice today, I am hoping that you are indeed a dedicated student of the gun. I hope that you've come to that point in your life where you've decided I am a student of the gun. And remember, student of the gun doesn't mean you're a beginner. Uh, You're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Now, as your benevolent professor, Paul, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys, I've decided that I'm going to start giving you uh, recommended reading assignments, and you can take it for what you will. You're a free man or a free woman. You don't have to do it, but I highly recommend it. And I won't recommend a book or something unless I've actually read it myself. 
And what I'm going to recommend to you guys, I'm going to recommend to you guys today a text that was written, I believe it was in the 1950s. It was used, uh, this book has been used as a textbook. It used to be used as a textbook back in the uh, the olden days when uh, colleges and higher education actually cared about teaching people the history of American government and how we got to be the representative republic that we are and the struggles that our founding fathers went through to establish the current form of government. Now, you're probably saying, you're like, yeah, Paul, that's nice, but uh, no, you know, today our elected officials just ignore the Constitution. Okay, I got that part, but you need to understand it. And you need to understand where we came from because if we're ever going to right this ship, if we're ever going to make things the the way they need to be, to correct all the the just egregious abuses of the Constitution that are going on today. We need to have a foundation, you know, in knowledge. And I've already told you you need to read the Constitution and you specifically need to read the Bill of Rights. But in addition to that, you might be wondering, well, why did we come up with the Bill of Rights? Were they just sitting around one night drinking beers and are like, hey, write this stuff down. It sounds cool. Uh, or where did it come from? And this book, it's a, it's a, your first recommended reading from Student of the Gun Radio is going to be a challenge to you, and I hope that some of you are up to it. It's called, the book is called The Political Thought of the American Revolution, and it's by an author named Clinton Rossiter. Now, Jared, if you go to studentofthegunradio.com, there'll be show notes there, and the specific title of the book, Political Thought of the American Revolution, it will be up there. Now, what I can tell you is this book, unfortunately, is out of print right now. <laughs> Makes sense that something about the American Revolution and the political thought of it would currently, in 2013, be out of print, right? Makes sense. But you can find it if you are uh, a dedicated. If you're dedicated to searching for it, y- you have a search engine on your computer, your phone, your laptop, your tablet, whatever. Just type in the name, type in the author's name, and there are different online sites. You know what we did? We recommended this through Student of the Gun Homeroom, and Jared, guess what we did? We sold them out. Yeah, we sold them out. Uh, am- we we put the Amazon link up. And we actually sold Amazon out of all of their used copies of this book. But Amazon's not the only game in town. There are other booksellers out there. And you can find it um, if you look. So check it out. And I want you guys to get that book. I want you to read it. I just searched Amazon for The Political Thought of American Revolution, and it is currently unavailable still. So. But if yeah, go ahead and, and uh, just log in the uh, the book title and the author's name, and we'll put that up for you. It's Clinton Rossiter, and uh, there are other online booksellers that do have it available. I did check that before today's show. So yeah, if you're an Amazon guy, you're not going to be able to get it from them, but you can get it. And uh, I would, as, as it is out of print, and as we're talking about it right now, I wouldn't wait. Uh, I had actually I had somebody send us there like. They waited and they sent me a, uh, some note and they're like, hey, I went to Amazon. It was gone. I'm like, yeah, you know why it's gone? Because you waited. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we have, we are loaded with what we're calling West Coast Lunacy. What is it about being located close to the ocean that makes you an insane person? I don't understand it. There's, I If we wanted to spend money, if we want to spend uh, tax dollars, you know, instead of doing the spending a hundred million dollars discovering the mating habits of fruit flies, maybe we could uh, spend some money and discover why it is that being in close proximity to an ocean makes you a crazy person. I don't know why that is, and maybe we need to move farther inland. But uh, we are loaded with West Coast lunacy this week. And the first story comes from our good friends uh, up in Oregon. That's right, in Portland, Oregon. And you guys want to listen up and pay attention. We gave you a little sneak preview of this on uh, through the Student of the Gun Facebook earlier this week. But Portland's ban on loaded guns is constitutional, says the Oregon Supreme Court. And you're like, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? You, yes, the, the city of Portland has installed a ban on having a loaded firearm in public. Now, there are some exceptions to that. If you have a concealed carry permit, apparently Oregon is an open carry state. 
and they have an open carry legislation. But Port- Portland has decided that it's unlawful for you to be in possession of a loaded firearm in public unless you have certain, unless you meet certain criteria. Now, a lot of you guys out there, you know, guys and gals, you know, depending on where you live, are thinking, you know what? I don't care. I don't live in Oregon. I don't live in Portland. You know, those crazy people can keep their rules. Well, here is the problem. Here is the problem. And because of this, this was challenged. This law was challenged by uh, a person, a man who was arrested and uh, for violating it, for violating that policy. And his attorneys took it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court of Oregon, of, or not Oregon, yeah, of the state of Oregon said this. And this is a quote from, uh, from their uh, finding. It says, in the United States, comma, generally, and it has been recognized that the right to bear arms is not absolute and that the exercise of legislative authority reasonably restricting the right to bear arms to promote public safety is constitutionally permissible. So says the finding of the Oregon Supreme Court. And again, you guys are out there and you're in, in Ohio or Indiana or Florida or wherever you are, and you're like, well, yeah, I know that people on the West Coast are crazy, and I don't care. It doesn't bother me. Here is the problem with that. When a court, especially a Supreme Court, whether it's Florida, Texas, you know, Colorado, Oregon, California, when they issue a ruling or they state and they put down an opinion from the bench, what did we talk about before? That sets or establishes a precedent. And other courts nationwide, you know, remember we talked about this. When you know, and a, a, uh, a case comes before them, the first thing that a judge will do is they will or a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney is they will look for previous existing case law. What is case law? Case law is essentially in a nutshell when something has come before a court and they have found in a cert in a certain way. Let's say, you know, whether it's abortion or whether it's justifiable use of force or whether or not it's you, know, you name it. When a court rules in a certain direction or issues an opinion from the bench, that becomes case law. So it's not too far of a stretch to say that the Colorado State Supreme Court, you know, let's say Denver decides we're going to ban the carrying of concealed carry or we're going to ban all loaded firearms within the city of Denver. And, you know, somebody gets an attorney and they sue and they're like, no, you can't do that. What they're going to do is say, we are citing the precedent of blah, blah, blah case, state of Oregon, Supreme Court says. And what this and regardless of whether or not you care about the whole, uh, you know, can I carry a loaded firearm in public? Can I possess a loaded firearm in public? That's not really what this is about. What it is about is this court has said that the right to keep and bear arms, according to them, is not absolute. And that the legislative authority, if they feel that they are promoting public safety, that they can alter or amend the Constitution as they see fit. Let that sink in for a second. What the Supreme Court is saying is that the Second Amendment of the United States, and I, I don't have the, the uh, Constitution of the state of Oregon in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that somewhere in there it mirrors the, the Bill of Rights. Uh, if you look at your individual state or commonwealth, if you look at your Constitution, somewhere in there there is generally the equivalent to the Second Amendment uh, in there. So what they're saying is, that that is not absolute and that as long as the government cites public safety as their reason, they can do anything they want. They can restrict any type of firearms ownership. They can restrict whether or not you can carry it, whether you can carry it with ammunition in it, whether or not you're allowed to own certain types of firearms whether or not you can keep them in your homes, what configuration they are, what color they are, what smell they are. They can do anything they want as long as they cite public safety as their main concern. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your little necks right there, I don't know what will. You know, you guys use Second Amendment, you know, gun owners of America, all that, you know, thump your chest and I'm a proud defender of the Second Amendment. What the Oregon State Supreme Court has just said to you is as long as your local do good legislators, as long as your hippie liberals in your state Senate, Congress, the local township trustee board, the city fathers, as long as they state that public safety is their reason for doing X. They can do it legally and constitutionally, according to the court. That is a problem. If you don't see that as a problem, I'm not really sure why you're here. And like I said, there's probably a really fun NPR show you can listen to somewhere. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, think about it. That is, And that goes right back to our recommended reading, Political Thought of the American Revolution. Why did the Founding Fathers put in place the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as they did. Were they just bored one day? You know, they're just like sitting around and like, hey, this sounds fun. Write it down, Tom. And Jefferson wrote it down. He's like, Yoo-hoo, cool beans. Or did they put a tremendous amount of thought and experience and based on, you know, the history of the world at that time? Did they, you know, make the laws, write the laws, institute the laws, and the the founding of the nation based upon what they knew historically, what governments historically did to citizens when they gained control. Because let's face it, there's been 100,000 maybe revolutions uh, in one form or fashion throughout the history of the world. There's revolutions all the time. But things don't really change. And why is that? They don't change because all they do is change the, this, the name or the, the person that's in power. You go, you have a dictator A in country B and they have a revolution and they kick that dictator out and they replace him with another one. And then they replace him with another one and another one. And it becomes this weird, vicious cycle. And you say, well, why does that happen? Well, why that happens is because wherever it happens to be, whether it's Italy, Germany, China, you know, France, India, it doesn't matter. What all they're doing is they're swapping bodies and the the core problem is still the same. And the core problem is that whatever country you're talking about, the citizens are essentially slaves to the state. Whoever happens to be in power at that point in time is the boss man. They are the ruling class and you do what we say. It doesn't matter whether they're communist, socialist, fascist, you know, an oligarchy, a freaking, uh, you know, monarchy, whatever. The, the citizen is, the, is subservient to the state. And why the United States of America is different and it was founded differently is because all the people who came here came from places where the citizen was 100% subservient to the will of the state. And they said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to play that game. It's the opposite. What we're going to do is we're going to stat. We understand that we have to have a form of government to prevent anarchy. We it has to be, you know. And they actually struggled over, uh, you know, over government. You know, a lot of guys were very, very afraid of government because what they knew is historically that the eventually the government will set itself up as the master, and that the citizens will be second. In, you know, they're, they're second to the government. The will of the state is supreme and the wills and desires of the citizen are second or third concern after everything else. And ask yourself right now, as you look out across the landscape, as you read the news, as you do, you know, go about your life. Do you feel that today in the United States of America that you as a citizen as a, you know, you're not a felon, you're not a criminal, you were born here, you're here legally, your parents were here legally, uh, you are a citizen, you have a vested interest in these United States. And do you believe that you're in charge or that you have to submit to the whims and wills of the state, whether it's the IRS or the EPA or the Department of Motor Vehicles or whatever, do you feel that you're constantly being put upon by the state. Yes or no? You know, be honest with yourself. And if you're, if the answer is no, you're like, no, I'm good to go. Then drive on, buddy. And I wish I could live where you were. But uh, think about that and uh, understand that the lesson from our friends in at the Oregon State Supreme Court is that anytime the ruling class decides to get together and pass an anti-gun law, as long as they cite public safety as their reason for doing it, they can do anything they want. Now, uh, 
Before we get into this next one, Jared's going to give us a little special, uh, he's going to give us a special bump. Assume the position. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Thank you, sir. May I have another? Thank you, sir. May I have another? So I guess we'll title this next segment, Thank You, Sir, May I Have Another. <laughs> Do we like that? Well, California is at it again. And uh, if, if you're uh, one of my, my friends in California, if you live in the uh, People's Republic out there, what you, what you probably already know is that the California Senate has just approved eight new gun control bills, including ammunition registration. That's right. You heard that correctly, that in California right now, Apparently, it is not enough. They're trying to, I guess California and New York are trying to out-crazy each other. They're trying to out-liberal each other. Uh, they've got this little East Coast, West Coast rivalry gro- going on where they're like, you know, Bloomberg and Kumo are like, we got the most, we got the most gun control laws in America. And California's like, oh, no, you don't. We got the most gun control laws in America. And so they kind of have the whole East Coast, West Coast feud thing going on. Well, um, the California Senate has stepped it up, and they've decided that, 10-round magazines and assault weapon bans and waiting periods and bullet buttons and all that other uh, crazy lunatic stuff that they've got going out there in California. It's just not enough. It isn't enough. Well, A, what does that tell you? That gun control laws don't stop crime. (gasps) What? With it, but in this, we've been saying this for years, decades even, is that uh, it's never enough. There's never, there's never going to be enough in, uh, to satisfy an anti-gun, anti-freedom politician. He will never, ever, ever be satisfied until you are completely stripped. And heck, even even in England, there's such lunatics in England. Sorry, English friends, but they're crazy. I don't know if it's in the water or what it is or because they are in such close proximity to the ocean. But uh, they already long ago stripped the rights of the citizens to keep and bear arms. There is no such thing in England. Well, that wasn't enough. Now they had to keep you from having a lockable folding knife. Do you guys know that? You guys know that it is illegal in the country of England to have a folding knife in your pocket if it has a locking mechanism in it? Yeah. Yeah. They're, and they want to you to register kitchen knives over a certain length. Did you, did you hear me? Register your kitchen knives. It is never, ever, ever enough. And all you, if you're out there and you're listening to me and you actually stumbled upon Student of the Gun Radio today and you're like, what's this dude all about? What's he talking about? Uh, If you are one of the reasonable men, if you think, well, you know, I can understand certain reasonable laws, certain reasonable restrictions. I mean, come on, let's just work together. You need to understand this. Number one, you're in a you're in a fantasy land because it is never, ever, 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 ever enough. California already has, you know, like between them, Washington, D.C., Chicago and New York, most restrictive gun laws. And Colorado's getting on that bandwagon. Colorado's it's funny. You got a West Coast. And you got an East Coast rivalry, rivalry for the uh, gun ban laws. And now you got little Colorado in the middle, and they're like, yo, yo, don't forget about the CO. Don't forget about Colorado. We're going to get more gun control laws than all of y'all. But, uh, yeah, they, they what they want you to do now in California, in addition to all the other lunacy, is they want to set up an ammo registry, and they want you to have to go through a background check to purchase ammunition. Yes, you heard that right. So they figured, well, somehow we're not able to stop these people from getting guns. And, you know, the the uh, the firearms industry has bent over backwards to make all these weird, funky California legal guns. And do you know before in California, before a firearms manufacturer is allowed by the state of California to sell their product in that state, that that product must be approved by the state and that if you're a firearms manufacturer and you want to sell your product in California, you have to submit a minimum of three guns 
to the state inspector's office and they get to keep those guns and they put them on file. I don't know what they do with them because I can't imagine, I don't know, they run them over with cars or something or they saw them in half or they scrape off the serial numbers. I don't know what those crazy people out there in California do, but you have to submit a minimum of three guns to them so that they can approve your gun. So it takes right now, if you're Ruger, Smith & Wesson, you know, Colt, Springfield, you name it. If you want a one of your firearms to be approved for sale within the People's Republic of California, you have to submit guns to the state and they'll tell you whether or not. And it's a, it's a like a six to nine month process, I believe, before. So think about that. You're Ruger. You come out with a brand new gun. You're like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Gun Owning America, check out this new gun. It's awesome. It's great. It's fantastic. And everyone in the country gets it before California, and it takes six to nine months for them to approve the gun for importation into the People's Republic. But that's not good enough because you people are still getting ammo, so we got to come up with an ammunition registry. we got to make people go through background checks to get ammo. It's crazy, people, and if you're part of it, we feel sorry for you, but... You know, right now the border is still open and you don't have to live in California. You don't have to give them ridiculous amounts of tax dollars so they can take that money and use it to abuse you and to enslave you. But, hey, it's your life. Live it like you want it. Now, the last West Coast lunacy, the last instance of of West Coast insanity. Now, where have we been on the West Coast so far? We've been in Oregon up in Portland. We've been in California. Well, now we're going up to Seattle, Washington. And in Seattle, the mayor up there has decided that uh, he, she, it, I'm not sure what the mayor is up there. Oh, it, 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 its name is Mike McGinn, and it is afraid of guns. It's really scared of guns. Uh, but but uh, McGinn there, he thinks it's a great idea if if uh, the uh, the business owners, they all need to put up uh, black and white and red placards in their businesses and tell people that their guns are not welcome there. And uh, again, we have the we have the lunacy uh, of the left. Ask one of your if you have a liberal friend, and I'm sorry that if you do you do, but uh, if you have liberal coworkers or lunatic coworkers or the reasonable man, the reasonable man who thinks, well, you know, it's a private business and they have the right to post. And you know what? They do. And you have the right not to spend your money there. But be honest with yourselves. Come on, folks. Can we for five seconds be honest? Ask the the uh, the you know, the gun, the whatever, the owner who puts up this sign, the business owner, the coffee shop, the restaurant, the, the quickie mart, the whatever. Ask them. Do you and don't have you don't have to be confrontational with them. Just say, you know, do you believe that that sign will keep people from coming in here and robbing you? Simple question. And unless they're just a total liar or disingenuous, well, I mean, maybe they do. Maybe the guy behind the counter thinks by putting a plastic sign in his door to remind felons and crackheads and, and, you know, other vermin that he needs to remind them that they're not supposed to rob him because they didn't know it before they walked up and saw the sign. They're just they're just living their lives, man. Jimmy and Johnny Crackhead, they're just living their lives. They're like, hey, let's stop over here and let's rob this guy. So they walk up and they're like, oh, man, do you see the sign on the door? We're going to jack this guy up. We were going to rob him. But, oh, well, I guess we'll have to go rob someone else because that little sign tells me I can't bring a gun in here. Come on, folks. Seriously? But old Mike McGinn up in Seattle, he's he is on a campaign. He's on a campaign to convince business owners that they need to put up signs to keep people with guns out of their businesses. It's completely disingenuous. It's a total lie, and it's propaganda, and you need to realize it. And you reasonable folks out there need to stop being reasonable. The time for being reasonable is over, ladies and gentlemen. You're being reasonable to the point where uh, the reasonable noose is being put around your neck. Why do you think we are at the state we are in 2013? Because we as the good citizens, the people that pay the taxes, that built this country, have been reasonable. 
and we've been afraid to stand up and we've been afraid that we're going to hurt someone's feelings. If you're more worried about hurting someone's feelings than you are about the safety of your own family, I don't even know what to talk to say to you. Get your priorities right. Quit worrying that you might hurt someone's feelings and protect your nation. Stand up and protect the founding of this nation. Understand how and why it was founded. And when you encounter ridiculous ninnies like this person up here in uh, um, in Seattle, now I've got I've got a I've got a quick confession to make. Uh, with all due respect, I was just recently made aware of the fact that the chief of police of Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, did undergo experimental surgery to have his testicles removed. And I don't know what that makes him, uh, he or she right now, but the, the police chief down here has been doing the same Mike McGinn craziness, uh, going around and, and handing out signs that he had printed up. And, uh, we're investigating, we're trying to figure out whether public money was used to print these signs, uh, to give up to businesses because of the whole Mississippi open carry thing. And all of a sudden they think that Mississippi people carrying guns is somehow new or people in Mississippi been carrying guns for a long, long time. But folks, uh, we're all out of West coast lunacy right now. We hope that you enjoyed our little sojourn out to the West coast. And for all of you East coasters, I know you're probably feeling a little bit dissed right now, but we'll get back with you guys real soon. Now we're going to take a quick break, but we will come back with part two of this week's episode in just a moment. Stick with us. In part two, we're going to be talking about taking your gun to dinner. So stay tuned. 